Welcome back to Radio Signals. My name is Mark, and my call sign is N9WIB. This is the Technician License Series, Lecture Number 13, Transceiver Functions and Components. In this lecture, we will learn about all the knobs and buttons of the radio. Specifically, we will review frequency selection, setting the mode of operation, transmitter functions, receiver functions, power amplifiers, and briefly define digital signal processing and also software-defined radio. One of the first things to do besides turning the radio on is to determine what band and frequency you want to operate on. You can transmit and receive depending on what your preferences are. So the radios may be single band, dual band, or multiband. So the first process of determining where you want to operate is by selecting a VHF band or UHF band, or if you have an HF radio, determine if you want to operate on 80 meters, 20 meters, 10 meters, or 40 meters. And there's typically either a button for this or a some type of frequency selection knob. So select the band, and then once you're on the appropriate band, you're going to select or tune the frequency. One good thing about amateur radio is we're not necessarily channelized like uh, GMRS or typical walkie-talkie frequencies. We're able to scan through a select range of frequencies and select the exact frequency that we would like to operate on or a frequency that's clear and not in use. The only thing that's channelized in amateur radio is uh, 60 meters. So outside of that, you're free to scan back and forth and select the ideal frequency within your privileges to operate on. Besides being able to use a knob, which is called a VFO or variable frequency oscillator, and you can tune the frequency using the VFO, on many radios you're able to also just key in the frequency. So if you wanted to operate on a VHF range of 146.52 megahertz, you would be able to directly key that in or just turn the frequency knob and dial in the frequency directly. Another advantage of many uh, relatively modern radios is that you can select memory channels and store your favorite frequency in memory channels. One thing to take note of is beware of your privileges with amateur radio and be careful not to go outside of your operating privileges or your uh, frequency privileges. So if you're a technician class, you're going to have a certain set of operating frequencies. If you're a general class, you're going to have to be careful of the HF frequencies that you're on and not to go into the extra frequencies. And if you're an extra, you can pretty much operate on any amateur radio frequency that you would like, but you have to respect the boundaries and not go beyond the frequency or band range. So one common issue or error is to operate too close to the band edge. And if you operate too close to the band edge, depending on what mode of operation you are, you may actually exceed the band edge and go out of your uh, privileges. So for an example, let's say you're an extra class license and you're operating on the 20 meter band. The extra class license has privileges from 14 megahertz to 14.35 megahertz. And let's say you want to tune to a frequency of 14.34 megahertz. As you remember, the extra class or the actually the 14 uh, megahertz region on the 20 meter band operates on upper sideband. So if you go beyond the upper sideband, you're going to be compromising. You're going to go into potentially uh, a frequency range outside of your privileges. So the tuned frequency of 14.34, if you're operating on upper sideband, given the bandwidth of the upper sideband signal, you're going to go beyond that 14.35 megahertz region into an area where you're not supposed to operate. So just be cognizant, be aware of the band edges, and just account for a little bit of margin of error and operate within the, the, uh, the frequency range that is appropriate. 
The next thing you should do is select the mode of operation. Radios may be single mode or multi-mode. They can operate FM, FM narrow, which has a smaller bandwidth, or single sideband. So single sideband is also available for VHF and uh, UHF frequencies, although not commonly used. It is more commonly used in the HF realm along with AM, digital, as well as CW operation. Most VHF and UHF radios are single or dual mode FM. Another important consideration is to set the amount of power that you transmit with. So for VHF and UHF radios, the power level is typically 1, 5, 25, or 50 watts. These are usually set in increments. They're not a continuous sweep where you can uh, enter in the power setting from 0 to 50 watts. It's usually anywhere from maybe 1 to 2 to 5 watts on a typical HT or handheld transceiver. And on a mobile rig, you'll have the option of operating on a lower power setting, such as probably 5 watts, but then increase it to medium setting, which is 25 watts, or high setting, which is 50 watts. HF radios are a little more, uh, you have a little more options. So instead of having definitive ranges of power settings from 1 to 5 to 25 to 100, you can actually dial in your power setting from 0 to 7 watts to 8 watts up to 100 watts. And then if you have a power amplifier, you can even set it even further. Some radios will come stock with the ability to transmit power on HF more than 100 watts, maybe up to 150. But typically anything more than that, you'll require some type of amplifier. And one important thing to note is operate at the lowest power level that is able to effectively get out your communication. So if you're just talking to your friend who's maybe 300 feet away, you don't necessarily need to operate 50 watts on your mobile uh, VHF radio. You can probably operate on one watt. And the same holds true for HF radio. If you can get your signal out effectively, there's no need to operate 1500 watts. If your signal reaches uh, the person you're talking to effectively at 100 watts, then tone it down and bring it down to a 100 watt level. And that's part of the FCC guidelines as well. And if you're tuning a radio, especially with HF radios, always tune at low power. And this will hopefully decrease the chance that you're going to damage your radio in the tuning process. So don't tune at high, high power, just tune at low power to effectively adjust your SWR. Microphone gain is something that you can play with once you unpack your radio and become familiar with it. You do not need to adjust this every single time you use your radio or transmit, but it is something you should become familiar with once you unpack your radio, either your HF rig or your UHF rig. It is essentially sets the audio level that is sent to the modulator circuit. It's just essentially setting the sensitivity of the microphone to your voice to pass that on to the uh, modulator to actually create the RF signal. So if it's too sensitive, your voice will appear to be distorted. Your voice will be transmitted in a very distorted fashion. So you want high audio quality. So set the microphone gain a little bit lower if you note signal distortion or other parties note that your signal is distorted once it's received. If you set your microphone gain too low, that means you're not getting enough audio frequency or energy into the modulator and your signal will present to others as very soft or quiet. So it's important to set your, mo your uh, microphone gain at the appropriate setting. And of course, to actually transmit on the radio, you need to do something. You need to activate the transmitter. And that's usually through what's called the PTT or push to talk switch. The push to talk switch is a manual switch that allows you to effectively switch from the receiver mode to the transmitter mode and uh, allows you to get your signal out. 
There is also an option of a voice operated transmitter or voice operated switch on many of the newer radios where you don't have to manually press a button or step on some type of uh, key to activate the transmitter. It senses the audio and senses your voice and will automatically open up the transmitter function and transmit. And when you stop speaking or the audio level goes down, it will switch the transmitter off and go into receive mode. So those are essentially the two broad options for activating the transmitter. There is also the ability to transmit Morse code or CW by a transmitter key. And uh, you have a few options for this as well. A straight key is essentially a switch, and that switch turns the a tone on and off. It'll can it'll turn a carrier on and off and transmit that. So when you depress the switch on a straight key, you are actually transmitting that single tone and uh, it manually modulates the RF on and off. And if you let go of that key, the circuit is now open and the signal is no longer transmitted. You can also get something called an electronic here, which generates the dots and dashes associated with CW or most Morse code automatically. This has the benefit of having perfectly timed or formed uh, dots and dashes to the appropriate setting. It does not rely on you to press the stray key for the appropriate amount of time to create a dash in comparison to the appropriate amount of time to create a dot. Usually it's a three to one function. So you should have a, you should depress it three times as long as you would for a dot uh, to transmit a dash. Transmitter PEP, or Peak Envelope Power. This is the measure of an AM or single sideband peak power output feed line to the antenna. It's not a measure of average power output. It is the peak power that you're actually transmitting. So the maximal power you're transmitting on an AM or single sideband uh, frequency. It is not the average, but the peak. So there are things also called dummy loads. So instead of transmitting into an antenna and transmitting on the air, you can transmit, you can flip a switch and transmit into something called a dummy load. So a dummy load is used for testing and tuning and debugging your radio or feed line. It sends the RF energy through the feed line to a dummy load and does not transmit radio signals it essentially transmits or puts all the RF energy into a very heavy duty resistor, which dissipates the energy as heat. And as a heat sink, it can uh, commonly use oil to absorb all the energy and the heat. So during transmission, spurious signals can also be generated. Speaking too loudly or too close to the microphone, this is called, obviously, overmodulation, which we covered, can cause signal distortion. And again, this is known as overmodulation. So either back off from the microphone or turn your microphone gain down a little bit. Uh, setting the microphone gain too high can also cause distortion of the signal and unwanted splatter on nearby frequencies. So it not only will sound distorted on the exact frequency you're transmitting on, but it actually may create or transmit on nearby frequencies. So you're essentially splattering beyond your designated frequency and causing interference to other stations. And again, to take care of this, turn the microphone gain down and hold the microphone a few inches away from your mouth, not directly to your mouth while you're speaking for uh, the best uh, transmission and the best microphone gain. So your transceiver is just that. It is a transmitter and receiver. They do sell dedicated receivers and transmitters, but nowadays you'll mainly be purchasing a transceiver 
uh, to receive signals and also to transmit signals. If you're into shortwave, then you're primarily going to receive, you're going to purchase a receiver and not necessarily a transmitter, especially if you're not licensed. But the receiver portion of your transceiver uh, has something called an AF and RF gain knob or switch. The AF is the audio frequency gain control. And this is essentially your volume button or uh, knob. So you can adjust the volume of the audio coming through your receiver by adjusting the audio frequency gain or AF gain control of the radio. Now it also has something called the RF gain, the radio frequency gain control. And this doesn't necessarily adjust the volume of the receiver, but it adjusts the sensitivity of the receiver to incoming signals. So if you turn it one way, it's going to make the receiver much more sensitive to incoming signals and pick up those signals, but it also will pick up more noise. If you turn it down, it's going to be less sensitive to faint signals, but there'll be less noise. Another feature of modern transceivers is something called Automatic Gain Control, or AGC. This automatically adjusts receiver sensitivity to maintain volume, uh, the volume constant for strong and weak signals. So let's say you're listening to a signal in Italy or Spain, a DX signal, and you're also listening to a signal that may be two or three states away on your HF rig. The AGC will compensate for this and maintain a relative uh, constant level. There are also buttons or functions called an attenuator and squelch, as we're hopefully all familiar with. An attenuator reduces incoming signal strength from nearby powerful stations that may overload the receiver. So let's say your neighbor uh, right next door is operating a ham station with 1500 watts and you're trying to listen to very far away signals. Um, the attenuator will reduce the incoming signal of your very powerful neighbor station to an acceptable level to not overload your receiver. Or the same holds true for nearby maybe AM uh, or FM broadcasting stations that maybe have very, very strong signals that could potentially damage your sensitive equipment and damage your transceiver or receiver. So the attenuator can reduce those small signals or those powerful signals. Squelch essentially mutes the receiver's audio noise when there is no signal present. So if the squelch, if there is an open squelch, that means there's no muting and all the noise and signals are heard. And you've probably experienced this as a, a younger adult or a child with your walkie talkies. If you turn the squelch all the way down, everything is heard. You can hear all the noise and all the static and everything else associated with the radio and uh, the desired signals as well. But if you gradually turn up the swel squelch, then all the noise is muted and the signal that's desired is only passed through. So you're only hearing the desired conversation. You're only hearing the desired digital tones or whatever you're listening to if you squelch out all the rest of the noise or the noise floor. An open squelch means no muting and all the noise and signal is heard. And a closed squelch means that your signal is muted. And if you have it completely closed, then you may not hear anything at all. So you have to modify or adjust your squelch setting to hear the desired frequency while minimizing the noise floor. And that's where we get into this squelch, squelch threshold is the point that the audio is heard and muting is turned off. So all the noise floor is, is eliminated, all the static is eliminated, but you're just hearing your desired frequency. Sensitivity is also a term in amateur radio and it is used to characterize or determine the receiver's ability or threshold for detecting signals. A receiver that's very, that has a very poor sensitivities 
isn't going to pick up weak signals. It's not going to pick up uh, signals well at all. But a, a receiver with that is very sensitive or has a high sensitivity will be able to pick up very faint and weak signals. And this is defined as the or specified as the minimal detectable signal level or MDS. And the MDS uh, is specified with units in microvolts. The lower the MDS, the more sensitive a receiver is. And uh, there is also something called a preamplifier. So if your signal is too low that's coming into the radio or receiver, you can utilize a preamplifier to amplify that signal from the antenna uh, before it gets to the rest of the radio to boost the signal and improve the sensitivity of the receiver. Selectivity is the ability of a receiver to discriminate signals. It's the ability for it to select the desired signals from the unwanted nearby signals. So it's the ability to discern a voice signal from a weaker station or a noise floor that's not necessarily wanted. So it has high selectivity if it's able to tune in those, those, uh, more faint or distant frequencies or signals. Filters are also very useful in amateur radio. They essentially allow the passage of the desired signal with rejecting of unwanted signals. Narrow filtering refers to allowing a small bandwidth to pass and reject others. So for example, 500 uh, hertz frequency is used for a CW. So you want a very small filter to allow CW in because it operates on a very small bandwidth. So you don't want to hear the other potential stations around who are transmitting voice or other CW signals. You want to block those out and just allow the 500 hertz CW signal to pass through. Wide filtering allows for a greater bandwidth to pass while eliminating others. So let's say you want to hear a voice signal or a phone signal on single sideband. You don't want to use your 500 hertz filter because that's going to take the majority of the filter of the signal away. You want to use a wide filter to allow for 2400 hertz to get through for single sideband. So you want to let that single sideband signal get through in its entirety while filtering out what's on the right and left of that signal. Notch filters are also very useful. They're essentially allows you to mute a certain portion of the radio frequency spectrum your spectrum you're trying to tune in on to eliminate an undesired or unwanted signal. So let's say you're having a conversation on HF and you're on a uh, lower sideband, but somebody just decides to tune in right in the middle of your signal and that very narrow carrier is right in the middle of your single sideband causing a lot of distortion and essentially interrupting your conversation. On your radio, you can activate the notch filter and tune and turn a knob to match it with the interfering signal and that notch filter will essentially mute that very narrow slice of bandwidth that is causing the interference. The location of the notch can be adjusted to block uh, the very narrow interference such as again the unmodulated tone or carrier by tuning it back and forth. So you can move it, move it up and down um, several hertz or 100 kilohertz or whatever you really need to to select that certain area that's causing the interference. These are some examples of filter operations. So let's say that we have single sideband signals on the top row and a very narrow CW signal on the bottom row. And to the far left, let's cover narrow. So you're transmitting and talking to your friend and uh, all of a sudden you want to implement a filter because you think there's a little bit of interference either up frequency or down frequency from you. But you mistakenly chose the narrow filter. 
So that narrow filter is essentially going to block out a wider portion of the bandwidth than you really want. So this will all be muted or eliminated or filtered out and you're only going to be left with this small fragment of single sideband that you're hearing, which will cause distortion. So you're not going to be able to hear the signal appropriately. So instead of utilizing the narrow filter on single sideband, what you really want is to activate the wide filter. So let's say you have some spurious signals out in this range on either side and you're actually picking those up and you really don't want to hear them. So if you activate the wide filter, the wide filter will allow the full single sideband filter or uh, frequency to pass. You'll hear this portion of it, but all this will be filtered out or eliminated and you're hearing the whole bandwidth of that nice single sideband signal. Now let's apply the same thing to the CW signal. So you're hearing CW signals, but there's some spurious signals, maybe some other CW, or maybe somebody's even transmitting a voice or a significant noise level, either down frequency or up frequency of your CW signal that you're hearing. Uh, to eliminate that, you want to implement the narrow filter. And if you implement the narrow filter on a narrow CW bandwidth, you're going to get rid of all that noise while actually preserving what's in the center signal. But let's say there's the same case and you mistakenly choose the wide uh, bandpass filter for your CW signal and you have those same spurious signals or nearby stations that might be operating a CW and the noise floor and some other things that are popping up besides the signal that you actually want to hear. You're going to turn on that wide filter and it is going to eliminate some portion of the spurious signals, but you still have those nearby that narrow CW signal that's that are going to pass. And these things are going to cause interference so you really want a narrow filter and not a wide filter for a narrow CW signal. All right, let's go to the last example here. And this will be an example of a notch filter. And let's choose a different color for this. So you're having a conversation on HF and all of a sudden somebody decides to tune in or tune their frequency right in the middle of your conversation and right in the middle of your frequency. So it's going to be a fairly narrow signal, but it's going to be very annoying. So they're essentially uh, transmitting a single unmodulated uh, carrier or tone in the middle of your single sideband conversation. And this will uh, distort the single sideband conversation, not distort, but you'll be able to hear it less and you'll be able to hear this loud, annoying whine or tone in the middle of your conversation. So in that case, implementing a narrow and wide filter isn't going to do too much because that interfering signal is right in the middle of your desired radio frequency. So what you can implement is called a notch filter. And on a lot of radios, that notch filter can be uh, a variable width. You can actually set the width of the notch filter. And let's say you set the width to a certain amount of hertz, but it's off frequency. So you actually want to tune that notch filter and move it over here into your single sideband signal. But you want to move it where it overlaps that annoying uh, person who's actually transmitting and tuning up on your frequency. And that notch will essentially take a chunk out of your single sideband, a very narrow chunk out of your single sideband, and mute that. So then you have your notch filter that's overlapping that annoying signal and getting rid of it while preserving the remainder of your signal sideband filter, allowing you to hear things a little bit better. 
There are other devices to eliminate unwanted noise, and one is the noise blinker. This circuit removes certain types of noise. It detects sharp pulses from either vehicle ignition systems, motors, or arcing power lines. This is probably most effective in uh, mobile operations when uh, vehicle ignition systems are a concern or when motors are nearby or when power lines have uh, some type of fault or arcing nature to them uh, in a home base setup. This uh, essentially mutes the receiver during these sharp, sudden pulses of noise and effectively blinks out the peak uh, in noise. Receiver incremental tuning is also another neat option. It is, it is not a filter per se, but it allows the operator to change or fine tune the receive frequency while staying on the same transmit frequency. So let's say you're operating a contest and you have your defined frequency that you've been working for maybe the last uh, 30 minutes or so. And another station comes on, but there may be 500 hertz off or maybe a few hundred hertz off and their signal sounds distorted. Either their pitch is too high or too low, uh, but you want to use your RIT knob to actually tune in that station to better receive their audio and to understand them, but you're still transmitting on your same frequency. You're just moving your receive off uh, several kilohertz, I'm sorry, several hertz, uh, depending on how far you really need to go to receive the other station a little bit better. It allows you to, to better tune a station that may be off frequency, again, with a change in pitch of the other station's voice to better tune them in. Another very common uh, meter or device on your transceiver will be the signal strength meter. The It is called or referred to as the S meter and is numbered from S1 to S9. S1 is the weakest signal while S9 is known as the strongest. A change in one unit, S unit, very roughly corresponds to a change in signal strength by a factor of four, but this is a very rough estimate, so it's not something that's very calibrated, so don't necessarily rely on that. Um, the uh, Another key factor to remember is that it is partially subjective in giving uh, signal strength readings, in that the signal strength will change when the RF gain is modified. So if you change the RF gain to improve the received signals of weaker signals, then your S units are going to be going up. So you're telling the other station they're an S9 uh, from an S5, but you've actually modified your station to receive them better, and they really haven't done much to, to change their signal. So it's very subjective. And what happens if the receive station strength goes beyond that S9? So they're reaching maximal strength on the S meter. And if they do go beyond that, there are readings on the signal strength meter that are calibrated in uh, decibels. So it's common to tell a station that they're maybe 10 dB over or 20 dB over S9. So if you hear 10 dB over, that means you're 10 decibels above the S9 uh, received signal strength, meaning you have a very good signal. There are power amplifiers for both HF and VHF and UHF. Transceivers with low power output, such as handhelds, may be connected to an amplifier to boost the signal by a factor of five or more. There are rigs, such as QRP rigs, which operate at low power, that uh, if you want to, you can connect them up to power amplifiers to boost their transmitted signal, to boost the power. And to do that, the antenna is removed from the transceiver and hooked up to the input on the amplifier with a feed line or coax. And the antenna is connected to the power amp output of the amplifier. Amps may be used for single sideband and CW. 
as well, but most of the amplifiers will have a switch for uh, the different operational modes. So if you're switching between SSB and CW on your UHF and VHF transceiver, then you want to switch that uh, SSB or CW to the appropriate uh, setting. There are newer forms of radios which include uh, the latest technology, one being digital signal processing. So amateur radio has essentially gone from radios consisting of tubes to radios consisting of solid state devices, mainly uh, transistors and resistors and capacitors and nowadays things are moving towards mainly uh, microchips and the microchips as, as mentioned in previous lectures contain uh, several transistors to many many thousands or more of transistors in one packaged small setting so we're making progress as far as technology and those analog signals are partially being converted into digital format when uh, everything is is going to the microprocessor level so a digital signal processing actually converts an analog signal to a digital signal the mi uh, microprocessors and software are used to perform tasks such as filtering and noise reduction which were typically done with solid state circuits uh, consisting of transistors in the past and now it's all done by microprocessors which are controlled by software instead of redoing or um, redesigning the circuits. A DSP is a digital component of an analog solid state transceiver so it has both, both digital components and analog components. The next step up is essentially software-defined radio. Software-defined radios have microprocessors that change the radio frequency signal directly from the antenna to a digital signal. So there's no analog devices in between. The signal is converted directly from RF energy to a digital signal right from the antenna. The digital signal generated is processed by software and converted to audio and or graphical format on your screen, such as within a uh, waterfall for visualization. This allows for much smaller radio design and changes to the radio features of the radio um, by simply doing a firmware upgrade. So the software can be sent out or downloaded by a uh, through a company website and you can actually change the features on your radio or upgrade the features on the radio by a software or firmware upgrade as opposed to buying a whole new radio with these new features. Thanks for joining us again on Radio Signals. We hope you enjoyed another presentation. This one specifically on all the important buttons and knobs of your radio, as well as the various neat filters that are associated with the uh, transceivers. So look forward to seeing you next time. And don't forget to please support our channel on radiosignals.org. See you next time in 73.